We're going to get started with the um, Path Ahead webinar number six, number five, I think this is. If you uh, have been following along with the series, um, this one's going to be a goodie um, and very appropriate and very timely. So I'm going to wait another minute or so. and let people sign in. While we're waiting for people to sign in, people are popping in. Uh, is it snowy at your house? You can write in the chat box, yes or no. Uh, it is snowing at my house. All right, well, I'm going to, uh, let's see. Oh, not snowing in Glasgow. Snowy in West Yellowstone and snowing. Oh, hi, Sarah. Um, snowy in Big Sky. Okay, um, let's get started. People can can uh, hop in as they uh, sign in. Um, so this this episode is um, part of a series. We call it the Path Ahead. Um, you know, outdoor recreation is growing, and we're all wondering what lies ahead. Uh, so we, we uh, try to address the major topics that rural communities face in developing outdoor recreation amenities. Um, this episode is called Safe Travels, uh, Grants Planning and Preparation for the New Wave of Outdoor Recreation Tourism, which probably looks a little bit different than it did, um, you know, a couple months ago. Uh, before we get started, uh, Zoom practices, uh, we will answer questions at the end. We love getting questions. Um, if you have questions for a particular presenter, you can, um, you can put that down there in the Q&A, uh, but we'll grab them all at the end. Um, you can use the chat to, uh, to share those questions. And if you have issues, techno technological issues, you can um, text your issue to 406-200-8240 and the uh, Zoom fairies will help on the back end. Uh, first, a little bit about this uh, series. Um, the Path Ahead webinar series was a brainchild of um, Rachel Schmidt and myself. Um, Rachel is the director of the Montana Office of Outdoor Recreation and I am the founder and CEO of Montana Access Project, but I have um, quite a bit of experience in um, front country recreation and working and building nonprofits in rural communities that build trails. Um, I started the Whitefish Legacy Partners in the Whitefish Trail, and I also um, started the Montana State Parks Foundation. So I, um, we both realize that um, you know we need to build capacity across the state. Uh, we need to do it more than just once a year with an outdoor recreation summit. And we recognize that there's a huge disconnect between programs, land managers, and communities that are trying to facilitate and create outdoor recreation, particularly uh, underserved very rural and tribal communities. So we started this series to be able to build community around uh, um, folks that are having similar issues, similar challenges, and similar desires. Um, build capacity, kind of helping, helping be the back end a little bit for, um, for rural communities that may lack 
capacity in their nonprofit world or their local government world. And um, with the ultimate goal of building parks, trails, and quality outdoor recreation access close to home. So the reason that um, front country outdoor recreation is important, uh, and I'll say this, I say it every time, I'll say it again, I'll say it a zillion times, it's economy, health and wellness, and quality of life. Today, we're gonna focus particularly on the economy and particularly on the piece of the economy that is the non-resident tourist and tourism economy. We're gonna drill down on that. We're going to um, look at the importance of the economic impact of outdoor recreation. And I, I use this slide every time too. 81% of Montana residents participate in outdoor recreation and outdoor recreation is 10% of Montana's jobs um, in the state. And uh, I, I just wanted to highlight that um, hot off the press, uh, Montana's compensation for outdoor recreation jobs has increased markedly. Um, these numbers were just released by the uh, Bureau of Economic Affairs. I will include a link to those in the chat box um, for you to look at. Uh, hot off the press, released at 8.30 this morning. Uh, but Montana is doing a remarkable job of uh, increasing the compensation levels for employees in the outdoor recreation industry. So today, we're going to look at the ins and outs of the uh, Montana's tourism grant explain the intersection of outdoor recreation and tourism, talk about what kinds of projects are eligible for the grant, how to apply, tips and examples of winning tourism proposals. Uh, we'll hear about the latest outdoor recreation related insights, trends um, from Racine, and we're gonna learn about a super cool project in Harleton they're turning a brown, want to turn a brown field into a, a railway park. Very spunky, very, um, very uh, fired up community. So our guest is, we have Jan Stoddard, who is the uh, Bureau Chief for Industry Services at the um, Montana Office of Tourism and Business Development at, at Department of Commerce. We have Racine Freedy, who is the uh, president and CEO of Glacier Country Tourism, who's going to give our, our tourism insights. And we have Kathy Barda, who's going to talk about the super cool project in, in uh, Harloton. And to me, having those front country communities that are just really trying to uh, use their assets for all of the three prongs, economy, quality of life, and health and wellness is, is super inspiring. And I think you'll be inspired by it too. So with that, Jan, uh, if I left anything else, please fill it in and uh, take it away. Oh, all right, thank you. I, I am so excited to be here talking to you about um, a tourism grant program that we have um, at the Montana Office of Tourism and Business Development. So since 1995, this grant program has awarded over $1.2 million to 480 recipients. And it's truly um, a program that we try to make sure spans the state. So we've um, awarded grants from Ikalaka all the way up to Libby, and then from Scobie all the way down to Dillon. And there's been a real emphasis over the last couple of years of trying to make sure that we are doing our best to enable smaller communities and organizations to be able to apply for this program. Um, it is funded by lodging tax. So you're gonna see there's a very specific emphasis on visitors. And uh, if you wanna advance to the next slide, the intent of the program you can see is to award funds to projects that strengthen Montana's economy through the development and enhancement of the state's tourism and recreation industry. So we have three different categories that we're looking for um, projects in. Arts, culture, and heritage preservation, visitor facility upgrades or construction, and then niche um, product development that's in line with our Montana destination brand research. 
And this last category is truly, I think, the nexus of tourism and recreation. We know that visitors coming to the state, as well as our own in-state visitors, um, love the ability to get outside and enjoy all that Montana has to offer in terms of beautiful landscapes, but also recreational activities. And um, this is becoming increasingly important, what these assets and amenities are. I'm sure Racine's gonna talk about that in a little while. The other thing to know on these projects is Tourism grants are really set up more, more for the end of life of a project. So a generally great way to think about this is we don't get involved with what's under the ground. So we're not at either early stage property, buying a piece of property, doing um, electrical, water, sewer, any of those infrastructure things. We are more about how do you take the project that you're already working on it and make it extremely um, visitor friendly and um, also promote it. So next slide, Diane. So who's eligible to apply? And this has changed back and forth since 1995, but so we've arrived on primary nonprofit 501c organizations. So this could be a C6 or a C3, but it has to be a 501c. And we may ask you for your paperwork on this. Um, could be a tribal government, and it also could be a city or a county government as well. And the primary nonprofits, I just wanted to point out, it's not necessarily tourism organizations. It could be a recreational nonprofit. It could also be um, um, a community um, nonprofit organization. So um, we've really expanded that, I think, over the last couple of years to take a look at even economic development organizations and what they can bring by working together. So um, um, on requirements, a couple things to know. Uh, can we go back? Just one. Yeah, sorry. Want to run run through those three additional yeah. requirements? So you're all, you're limited to one application per cycle. You can't put in multiple applications. So choose your best project because this is a competitive process. And then next, um, eligible entities um, cannot use this project for pass-through projects. So for example, a nonprofit can't put in to buy, um, let's say a bus for a for-profit group. So that's something that you know, we, have, we look at real carefully from a legal standpoint. And the last piece of this is um, the asset or the proposed um, project has to be either owned by the entity or there has to be some long-term standing agreement with the owner. So an example of this is the Whitefish Legacy Partners Projects. We've had a couple of grants with that organization. They're putting in a trail through um, Whitefish and also out to some outlying recreation areas. And that trail actually passes through um, um, property owned by the city property owned by private business like the hospital and other entities. And one of the things we do ask to see is, you know, what's that long-term agreement that with the Whitefish Legacy Partner plus the owner of that property um, for maintenance and sustainability? Because that's really important. If we're gonna invest public dollars in a project, we wanna make sure that it'll still be around in um, five years. All right, Diane, next one. Um, the other thing to know about these grants is it does require a match. It's a two to one match. So for every dollar, dollar that you put in, we put in um, $2 as well. Um, what's important to know is, is when it comes to putting in a budget for, the, for this grant application, you'll have to define that. And then when it comes to being paid your invoices for the grant, we're gonna also ask you to demonstrate um, that $1 match. So just keeping that in mind on, on what's required in terms of match for the projects. Next one, Diane. So um, I, I feel so fortunate that we get to have a grant cycle this year. So, um, Normally, this is an annual process, but as I said, it's based on lodging tax. And as you know, starting last March, um, we had, um, we had an, a non-resident visitor um, um, sort of ban <laughs> where for a while people couldn't come to the state, right? And then um, we had such um, an impact from the pandemic 
that it really impacted um, our lodging tax collections last spring and um, through the summer. So initially this grant program starts out July 1st and runs through a fall um, review and awarding. This time we weren't even able to make a decision to offer the program till mid-October. So we've had to compress the application schedule so we can get um, the projects, as you can see, awarded by um, next January. And the reason we try and award them early in the year is Montana has a short um, construction cycle, right? Uh, if you're doing any kind of infrastructure at all, you've got to be able to access the area and get the work done while, while you can still do it. So although we're giving um, an end date for these grants of 6-30-2022, um, we are going to make those announcements by January. This is a, competi a very competitive um, grant cycle, just to let you know. And as those uh, applications come in, um, they're actually reviewed. We have a, a, a sort of a varied team that reviews them from the community development side, from the historical preservation side. Also, there's um, a couple people from our Tourism Advisory Council. We have a scoring process that determines um, who's going to get funding and if they get the full amount asked for, or sometimes we've had to cut back a little bit on some parts of the project that didn't qualify, or just because we didn't have enough money. So next one, Diane. So here's everything you're ever going to want to know <laughs> about the tourism grants. Um, Process and program, it's um, on our marketmt.com website. Um, there's a whole section just for the tourism grants program. And there's a couple of tabs I think that are really important to note. So there's one, a little bit of one about history. There's also one that talks about current and funded projects to give you some background if you're pu putting your application together of what kind of things we funded in the past. Um, there's also um, information on the current cycle that we're in, and that contains a link over to the application. So we use um, a software platform called Submittable. And the reason we chose Submittable is for ease um, of the applicant. So if you've ever done grant applications, you can know sometimes it's, it, they're just impossible. So we tried to set up an application where it was easy for you step by step you could walk through, there's an explanation of what we're looking for. And for the most part, we're not looking for pages and pages of explanation. We're sh looking for short, concise information that shows you understand it. Um, but you're able to articulate that in, in fewer words than, um, like I said, than many pages. Um, we also built templates for um, a budget um, worksheet that you'll fill out that we're trying to keep it as simple and as easy as we can. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the, there's a section also with additional information and resources. And that's a really cool page. It actually has a recorded webinar to help you on filling out your application. It's got frequently asked questions. It has copies of all the templates. It has access to um, research and data, which is required in your application. And then it also gives you examples of what a completion requirement would look like. So going in before you're filling out that application, you can look at all those different forms you're going to use and going to need and get ready ahead of time before you start typing. You'll also see there's a contact information for Michelle Cushman. She's actually the program manager for the tourism grants and Michelle could be on the webinar today because she's um, her daughter's getting married <laughs> in a couple of days. So she's sort of buried with those details. She'll be back next week. Michelle is a wonderful person for helping you in any way she can, whether it's with the application or whether it's putting together your strategies, um, feel free to email or call Michelle because our goal is to help you um, put in a great application and be as competitive as you can, especially if you don't have a professional grant writer, right, within your organization. So again, our job is to help you. There's Michelle's contact information or um, feel free to contact me. Next one, Diane. All right, tips for a winning proposal. So um, when it here's the things we're looking for um, when we review and score these applications. 
So remember that although um, a community park project could definitely be benefits local residents, we need to hear what your non-resident and resident visitor interface is. So putting something together, how, how is it going to, how are you going to build that, asset, uh, that asset so people want to come, go there, have that experience? So if, if it's for um, a trailhead location, what are you going to do that, again, drives people to that location and has the things on it that visitors are looking for? We're looking for strong project planning with a marketing component. So really important to these grants, and this has been a change over the last couple of years. Don't just tell us you're going to develop a website. Tell us how people are going to find that website, how you're going to promote that website. How are you going to get information out about it? We need to know if you're building a bike camp, how are people even going to know it's there? Because that goes hand in hand. You, you can build an amenity, but unless people know about it, they're, they're not going to come. There, we'll ask for a detailed budget, but collaboration with tourism community and recreation partners, and you'll see that in the examples. If you only come in with no letters of recommendation that are required and no definition on how you're going to work with other partners, how do we know your project is going to have, has first of all, has buy-in from someone beside your organization? Does it have buy-in from the community? You know, are people working together on it? And how do we know long term there's going to be an investment in keeping um, whatever you, you've done going? Um, there's a requirement for research and data. So just sort of just justify why you think this project's going to be successful and why you think it works for resident and non-resident visitors. And again, on that website, there's some links to existing resources for that. We're going to ask you for metrics and reporting. And we get calls all the time from the public, from legislators, and from our own state audit teams asking to demonstrate there's value attached to these grants. And how do you attach value? You have to come up with some way of measuring value. So again, we're willing to help you that, but I've got an example um, of how one small group did that. We're looking for that return on investment. You know, what does it mean for your community to be able to do this? Um, and finally, what's the long-term sustainability? There's a question in the application that asks, in the long run, who's gonna maintain this? Who's gonna keep it up to speed? If it's a website, who's gonna do those updates? If it's signage, who's gonna check them to make sure they haven't been damaged? So that's a really important part, again, with that ROI and going back and justifying these dollars that are spent, that this isn't a one-off. This is something that's gonna live and grow destination development in your community. Diane, next one. Um, Jan, I'm, I'm, I hate to tell you, but we're, we're out of time. Um, oh my gosh. No, I know, but, um, but I'm going to, um, I'm gonna cheat the Q&A session. We have about seven to 10 minutes. Um, so if you can, um, you know, go through these examples, which are super inspiring, um, that would be great. Okay, so I'll be very quick. So Dylan received uh, Bike Walk Southwest Montana organization out of Dylan received 9,900 to put together a bike camp. And if you'll note, they had 4,000 walkers and bicyclists they identified. So there's their data set justifying that investment and you can see by what they did here was it was more end of um, construction project. Next one. So another small community um, organization called Cut Bank Trails that's working to develop a trail around um, Cut Bank to encourage people to stop, take a walk, learn more about their community because we know the longer people stop the more money they will spend in a community. So they actually put together um, signage um, along the trail and some benches um, to create um, awareness about their community and about um, Lewis and Clark. They also created a brochure and distributed it um, around the area and also to people staying in the area to bring them onto the trail and take a look at the signage they had put together. Next one, Diane.
So the next one was a little bit bigger project, but here's an example of a community park that became much more than just a community park. So this is, in this situation, um, the city of Conley Falls actually worked with Fish, Wildlife and Parks to improve um, amenities, including a fishing pond, um, signage. They had visitor information that they worked on together. And um, one of the interesting things was they went together, the city and FWP, to um, host fishing events and, and went and promoted those. And the city actually, in this case, upgraded their website and put a whole page on um, about the park and inviting visitors to come to the park while they were in Columbia Falls. And the last one that I have is um, an example out of Libby. So here's a project that, um, act, that benefits in the summer because they um, did two things. They put in a visitor and event center and they also put in a three quarter mile roller ski track that you can walk on the summer, but then you can use it for training as well. But this project really um, was about um, pulling in non-resident visitors, not just for training, but to their events um, through the winter. So the second paragraph just was um, information when it came to their final report and metrics that they said despite the COVID epidemic, they were still able to hold events. And it was amazing to me that 60% of the people that came were not locals. So here's something that we can show that um, although this project, you could say, really benefited local and regional people, it was actually pulling in non-resident visitors as well. Thank you, Diane, for those extra two minutes. <laughs> sure. Well, that's it's really inspiring. Um, I I just love hearing about projects that are are just uh, you have champions on the ground that are really thinking about what they want the future of their community to look like. And I will say, on the Columbia Falls, my uh, friend took all the dirt from that swimming from that uh, pond that they dug. So they were uh, that was definitely a win-win. Um, now I'm going to turn it over um, to Racine. Um, you know, we've talked about the tourism grant, but I think um, having some uh, some up to date insight about uh, tourism, what it looks like for those of us who live in high amenity communities like, um, you know, Whitefish and the Flathead. Um, we saw a little bit different pattern, but it was definitely um, robust. So I will look forward to hearing um, Racine's take on that. Great. Thank you so much. It's always a great opportunity to um, talk about tourism. It's one of my favorite topics in the world. Uh, and we're just going to talk about a little bit about destination marketing, uh, look about our, our outlook and some of what the data is telling us. And then what our strategy is, what it used to be, where, where we need to take that and then what Montana visitors are seeking. So advanced slide, please. Um, again, my name is Racine Freedy. I'm the president and CEO of Glacier Country Tourism. And we are one of the uh, destination marketing organizations that are funded by lodging tax. Um, we're one of the six uh, regional uh, DMOs in the state. And we represent Flathead, Glacier, Lake, Lincoln, Mineral, Missoula, Ravalli, and Sanders County. Advanced slide, please. Um, first off, I really like to talk about what destination marketing is and what it means to Montana. So first off, this is a very specific type of marketing that promotes a destination. So a town, uh, a city, a region, a country with the purpose, like what John was talking about, of bringing visitors into that area. Advanced slide. And who does destination marketing? Um, this is done by a destination marketing or management organization, and I call them DMOs. Uh, they are most often a convention and visitor bureau, a CVB, or tourism board like Glacier Country. And we are responsible for promoting a community as an attractive travel destination and enhancing its public image as a dynamic place to live, to work, and to play. And through the economic um, impact of travel, we strengthen our through the impact of travel, we strengthen the economic position and provide opportunity for people in our communities. Advanced slide, please. 
DMOs are essential to the economic and social well-being of communities we represent. We are driving economic impact through the visitor economy, fueling development across the entire economic spectrum by creating familiarity, attracting decision makers, sustaining air service, and improving quality of life in a place. Uh, destination promotion is in fact, and I believe this with all of my soul, um, it is a public good for the benefit and well-being of all. It is an investment that no community can afford to go without, um, without causing detriment to our community's future economic and social well-being. Advanced slide. Um, and if you subscribe to the circle of life concept, uh, she's a futurist and an amazing woman in our industry. Um, she created the destination management cycle, which goes like this. If you build a place where people want to visit, you build a place where people want to live. If you build a place where people want to live, you'll build a place where people want to work. If you build a place where people want to work, you build a place where people needs to be. And if you build a place where business has to be, you build a place where people have to visit. And it all starts with a visit, and that visit starts with marketing. Advanced slide. Tourism is indeed the first date for economic development. Uh, destination marketing organizations help plow the road for economic development agencies, for local corporations seeking to recruit top talent, for colleges and universities to bring students to campus. And frankly, in this day and age, for communities to be able to incent those who have moved away to return home. Advanced slide. And what does that mean for our communities? Well, tourism industry works to promote and preserve the qualities that make Montana a great place to live, to work, and to play. They, the travelers that we're talking to or talking about, add to the lifestyle that we as Montanans enjoy by providing better air service, increasing the quality of life and the quantity, the quality and quantity of restaurants, retail shopping, special events, recreation opportunities and attractions. If you really, really think about it, what we enjoy now is far more than what the state's population could afford um, on its own. Now shifting into kind of Montana's tourism outlook, pre COVID-19, Montana was seeing a steady upward growth in visitation and visitor spending. 13.4 million non-resident visitor, visitors traveled to Montana in 2019. They spent $3.7 billion, billion in direct expenditures and another $2.13 billion in indirect, uh, contributing 5.8 of new money into our economy. Resident visitors like to, like to travel too. We get out and about just as much as anybody else. We, as Montanans, spent $1.1 billion in direct expenditures. And that is strictly on leisure one day and multi-day trips. That was $350 million alone just in our region. Travel and tourism directly supports approximately 43,000 jobs uh, directly, another 16 indirectly. And that accounts for 1.5 billion in associated labor income. Now, beginning in April of 2020 of this year, we started to see some pretty significant impacts. Tourism was the first sector of the economy we economy to see these impacts. We were the hardest hit and we are expected to be the last to see full recovery. Advanced slide. Uh, the Institute for Tourism and Recreation Research conducted four waves of surveys to Montana tourism businesses, including accommodations, tourism services, outfitters and guides, um, and tourism support services. And they asked a series of questions. Um, because of COVID, you permanently closed or will close your businesses. Anything in the red, um, dark red or yellow is either disagree or agree. Gray, brown is agree or strongly disagree. But they ask these questions. Will they permanently close? Will they expand my business? Um, do you have to increase the pricing? Will they be able to uh, stay open this season? Were they able to increase marketing? And you, you can see from these questions the answer was disagree to most of those. Um, now, as the year has gone through, uh, people have had to reduce marketing. They've had to be really aggressive on how they manage things, being efficient, changing operations, um, being aggressive on inventory management. They've had to adjust their seasons. Um, they've had to be really, really flexible on cancellation policies. But COVID has indeed impacted the tourism businesses substantially in the state of Montana. Advanced slide. 
Um, since April, again, we've literally been experiencing a live case study of what happens when travelers stop traveling. Um, we saw negative impacts on any kind of accommodations, outfitters guides, rentals, venues, sporting events, and a lot of the things that we enjoy as, as, as residents, and that's uh, food and beverage, attractions, festivals, music. Oh, I really, really miss live music events. Um, air service, shopping, uh, as Jan indicated, uh, we've seen decreased funding for a lot of the different programs that we have in the state and jobs and um, any workforce issues that we had before are just amplified right now. Advanced slide. Now Montana saw a higher than average visitation uh, compared to the rest of the country, um, along with many other Western states. And once visitation increased, outfitters and guides saw a stronger uh, uh, business. So they actually ended up on the positive side. Um, some of the things in blue were recovering well. Things are doing better and outpacing the rest of the country, but we're still not where we need to be. Um, accommodations uh, made a little bit of an impact, but frankly, we're going into a tough season. Uh, warm season is a whole different year than when you have a uh, cold season and it's, it's dependent on indoor activities or uh, ski areas and such. Air service though, Montana is outpacing recovery in the rest of the country. Um, our, in fact, I was just on the phone with uh, Missoula Airport today and we are about 50% of capacity and load um, that we normally would be. The rest of the country is right around 30. Um, but we're still seeing uh, continued challenges. Advanced slide. Oh. And some of the trends that we are seeing nationally, people are leaving urban centers. This is, this is nothing new. They are, they are going to other areas. They are seeking healthy and safe communities. They're seeking wide open spaces high quality of life, actual or perceived. And there's another thing that they're looking for. They're looking for broadband. And why is that? Because people are able to work and learn remotely. They're on the move. Um, and because of this, people who are traveling are actually taking longer trips. We are seeing significant increases in non-resident visitors to Montana. This is not unique to Montana. I mean, a, a, a lot of our friends and our family are like, oh my gosh, people are coming here. That's happening everywhere. It's happening across the nation and actually to some extent across the globe. Um, DMOs like Glacier Country, Office of Tourism and our other partners across the state, we are caught in a balancing act between keeping our communities healthy and safe and helping our economy recover quickly. And this is the tough one, good or bad. Montana is actually really well positioned to recover more quickly than much of the nation. Um, this summer, Montana and Wyoming were leading the way in recovery. And frankly, outdoor recreation opportunities were key to this. Um, and if we look at where this is going in 2021 and beyond, we will see a continuation of these trends. There will not be a big difference. Advanced slide. So pre-COVID, many DMOs were for focused on marketing. What we normally did was uh, we reached identified markets and audiences with a unified message. We created that desire to visit. We got them to come here and we encouraged them to return. But in the weeks and months after COVID, that slide please, um, we had to do a major pivot. DMOs rapidly abandoned our traditional outward facing sales mess uh, uh, sales and marketing efforts from non-residents and shifted lightning fast to helping our local businesses and communities. We used our marketing expertise to help communicate real-time information to local residents and non-residents. Advanced slide. So what we are doing now at this time is we're still presenting them with a unified message, but the message has changed. Um, we are now talking to people who have an intent to travel or are actively planning a trip. And we are trying to make sure that they under, understand um, what's happening in Montana. They need to know about the current uh, travel regulations that are in place. They, uh, we want them to travel safely, use safe face covering, social distancing, um, be sure to uh, 
uh, stay well, and if they are ill, stay home, um, and to know before you go. We also saw a whole different type of recreationists this year. <laughs> Not, these are people we don't normally market to. They're new to outdoor recreation. Um, and so when they came here, they were inexperienced. They didn't know the etiquette. They didn't know the proper things to do. They didn't know how to do it safely. So we have amped up our messaging around how to do that responsibly, leave no trace, fire safety, and how to keep our waterways clean from aquatic invasive species. And as we all know, we're trying to encourage people to be kind, be respectful, and be patient. That's something we've not normally had to do. Advanced slide, please. COVID forced DMOs to transition from destination marketing organizations to destination management organizations. Instead of implementing a comprehensive marketing plan, we now talk about community shared values in a way that explains the value of a destination um, and what destination promotion does uh, for it and connects that value in organizations to the residents of our community. Um, who destination organizations are helping? A lot of people are asking this, who, who, who's your customer? Well, the answer is to that um, is that destination promotion is for the benefit and well-being of every person in a community. It is essential investment to help develop opportunities and build quality of life to benefit the people of a destination. So in other words, our customer are our residents. Um, and because DMOs are caught in that balancing act that I referenced before between keeping our communities healthy and safe and helping our communities recover quickly, it's, it's critical now that we start to look at destination stewardship, community alignment, and strategic recovery plan, balancing economic development, sustainable tourism and quality of life, building public support around that shared vision and creating a thoughtful and strategic recovery plan that benefits our social and economic well-being. Um, we're talking about this because things are changing very, very quickly and ongoing. So we are continuing to have these conversations at the state, at the region, at the community level. And we hope to be collaborating and, and working more uh, around how to build that strategy also about how to get everyone to the table and work collaboratively as we move forward. Advance slide, please. And with that, I thank you very much and I look forward to the question and answer phase of today's conversation. Thank you, Racine, you have 32 seconds left. <laughs> um, Fascinating. Um, thank you so much. I have so many questions um, about uh, masks and Zoom towns, um, but I'll hold them off um, till the end. Um, it, it's it's really interesting. I mean, living in a in a tourist town, um, seeing that shift is uh, has been quite interesting. And then hearing how you guys are pivoting. Um, is also uh, very heartening. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it, thank you, Racine. I'm going to turn it over to um, Kathy um, to sort of talk about these programs in action and how um, rural communities and using Harlow as, a, um, as an example are embracing their outdoor recreation opportunities um, for tourism, perhaps, uh, I'll let Kathy talk about that, um, but also uh, to create these absolutely key pillars for um, quality of life and health and wellness of folks who live uh, in the region. So, um, Kathy? Yeah, take thank you. So, the Harlotten Rail Yard, it's an exciting 180 acre parcel of former Chicago, Milwaukee railroad land it's located just south of the city of Harleton. It's in its infancy of being redeveloped into a multi-use recreation site. Originally called the Montana Railroad, the rail yard site was located one mile north of the town of Marino, Montana. The townsfolk grew weary of walking that one mile to town, so in 1900, decided to move the entire town closer and change the name of the town to Harleton after the president of the railroad at that time, Richard A. Harlow. Um, next slide, please. 
Harlington is the county seat of Wheatland County, which is uh, located in the central part of Montana, uh, central part of the region of the state. Wheatland County is also an opportunity zone. The town is surrounded by the mountain ranges of the Little Belts, Crazy, Castle, and Big Snowy Mountains. Public lands are abundant with the Helena, Lewis, and Clark National Forests, BLM, and state lands easily accessed within a short drive. The project is located just south of the city limits of Harlow, and the Muscleshell River flows on, along the southern boundary of the project site. Uh, next slide, please. The 2018 population estimate for the town of Harlowton is uh, 1,076, with agriculture, hunting, and fishing employing 12.7% of the population. Harlowton is a hidden gem when it comes to recreation. Um, located just adjacent, which borders the railroad property, is the Wheatland County Rodeo Grounds and Chief Joseph Park. It's 67 acres of RV and tent camping, a fishing pond, and a kid's playground. And there's also um, a trail that goes through that the fairgrounds area, Chief Joseph Park, called Smoking, Smoking Boomer Trail, which was named after a local dog that used to greet the trains in the 1940s, uh, smoking a pipe. Uh, next slide, please. So the city inherited the railroad property and its extensive contamination when the railroad went bankrupt in 1979. And this slide shows a, a, an overview of the, the 180 acre site. Um, since 2010, they've partnered with Snowy Mountain Development Corporation, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Montana DEQ to properly assess the extent and severity of the contamination and to begin cleaning up uh, the petroleum and the asbestos. And primarily, the, the contamination occupies an area of about five acres right in the center, and that's that area that um, is uh, overviewed in that slide right there. Um, so um, recently, EPA has approved the use of Brownfields grant funds to develop a concept plan to redevelop this open space floodplain area into a recreation site that will serve residents and visitors to the community. Uh, next slide, please. So um, one of the exciting things it, uh, came about during the public meetings for the concept plan. So during the public meetings that were held to promote community engagement, the community um, identified the desire to expand existing trails, provide additional RV and tent camping, expand an existing fishing access site, and develop a day use area. But it was also, they placed significant importance on preserving an area that lies within that railroad site, which was um, known locally as Japanese town. Um, and Japanese town, the, the area of the Japanese town, there's some foundations left. And that, that area was um, just, off, just south of that roundhouse that was highlighted in that previous slide. And this is an important story to tell. So in the early 1900s, Japanese immigrants brought their families to town to work on the Jawbone Railroad, on the Jawbone Railroad, which was a spur from Harlowton to uh, Lewistown. And they successfully integrated into the community. At one point, um, the Japanese citizens made up about one fifth of the population of Harlowton. And then the 1940s, when the world went to World War II, um, all across our nation, the Japanese um, families were being rounded up and sent to internment camps out of fear for what they might do to our nation. But that did not happen in Harlowton. Um, when the government came to round up the Japanese, the community banded together along with some key influential people and stood up and defended the families and said that they were not a threat. And ultimately, the government agreed and allowed the Japanese families to stay. And, and that's a story that we want to preserve as part of our recreational site is preserving uh, the history of these families. Um, we've also recently reached out to the University of Montana Pacific Asian Studies and the uh, Montana State University Asian Studies programs to involve them how best to um, how best to preserve the history of the Japanese influence on on this area of Harlaton. And so next slide. 
So this is, uh, this is a draft map of kind of what we're envisioning and it, it does, um, it will have some edits made. You can see on the left side, we have a day use picnic area with restrooms, which is accessed from the highway 191. Um, there's a fishing access site. The, the blue lines that you see are the trails that they wish to uh, construct and expand upon. Um, they have some RV camping. Um, based on this map, they wanted to have less RV sites than what's um, depicted on the map to provide a, a higher quality RV camping experience so you weren't sitting right on top of your neighbor. Um, they're going to have tent camping. Um, you could see right there where they have uh, highlighted there in the center where it says the event center. That's where they want to make use of the existing uh, roundhouse structure, which is structurally sound, and where the trails branch off into kind of that Y that opens up uh, right below that is where the foundations for the Japanese town were. So they want to use um, the event center as kind of a, an interpretive center with signage and photos um, to, to honor the Japanese history of that area. Um, the green area to the right of that is where um, we've already been working on some cleanup activities. There's been um, a small area with wetland re restoration and uh, nature has been responding very favorably. Um, the wetlands are filling in, wildlife are moving into the area and those areas that have already been cleaned up. And um, birds are abundant, um, the cattails are coming back, they weren't even reintroduced, they just you know, once the contamination was removed, the resilience of nature is just um, becoming present to the area. And then they, uh, they wish to do um, like a, a, an amphitheater, but not build a structure, just actually do um, build up the ground so that people are sitting on the grass that rises up, um, up top there and, and have outdoor music. And um, there's a lot of great plans. We're still in the infancy. Um, we have lots of opportunities for additional grant funds um, once the concept plan is finalized and we're able to actually take advantage of some of the, the grants coming open. Um, it's a real exciting project and the community is completely engaged. Um, small town of Harleton, you know, has the different public meetings. We've had 30 people in attendance and you know they're very active they have positive um, contributions and they want to see the site develop because they see the benefit to themselves as well as to visitors promoting for you know the economy in their area so we're pretty excited about it we invite you to you know um, give us a call if you have any ideas or want to learn more um, i'm always happy to to talk about this it's it's like i said a real exciting project that we're happy to be a part of so I probably finished early, but that's what I had. <laughs> you did finish early. Shoot, Jan, do you, do you want to pick up? Um, I, I, uh, I learned about Kathy's project at the, um, the latest business of Outdoor Recreation Virtual Summit. Um, it's hard to, you know, the virtual conferences are a little bit different now. Um, and it's it's hard to really connect with people, but there was something about the enthusiasm uh, of of her project, and it just sounded intriguing. She just put a note up on one of those bulletin boards or something, and I ended up calling her, and we talked about it. And I I just think um, I, I just am inspired by inspired recreation, and I think when a project has is is a win 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 um i just wanted to i wanted to uh highlight that for uh folks who are interested in um resident and non-resident um visitors um we do we do have a few minutes um i'm gonna stop the sharing um uh, before I do, I just wanted to um, let you know we we have a Facebook group for to create community. So if um, you know folks want to with Kathy who did your plan or or uh, whoever wants to join and just sort of chat about um, who did what, um, what are you up to now? Um, have you had this kind of issue or how have you addressed this? Um, it's it's uh, designed to to just have those peer-to-peer -peer, um, interactions. 
Um, and I also want to announce, uh, I did not make a slide. Um, our next episode is scheduled for November 24th. And it's, it, uh, it's a little bit different angle of what we've been talking about, but it's called um, um, Zoom Towns. Is um, outdoor recreation access the new gold rush? Um, well, our guests will be Marnie Hayes, who is the um, executive director of businesses for Montana Outdoors. We'll have Christina Henderson, who is the executive director of Montana High Tech Alliance. Um, it's the trade group for high tech businesses. And as we all know, um, folks are moving here either as remote workers, um, Silicon Valley is moving to, to Hillicon Valley. I don't know, they have some terms for it. Um, but we know Bozeman is seeing the impact. Uh, we know that Missoula is seeing the impact and we know places in their orbits like Livingston are really seeing their impact. So we'll also hear from Erica Lighthizer with the Park County, um, uh, working with the Park County Environmental Council talking about like what happens when your town becomes a Zoom town and you're not ready. Um, Bozeman and, and Missoula have arguably have, um, you know, more uh, infrastructure to be able to absorb some of that growth. But towns like Livingston that are getting pressed really hard um, by the growth in, and uh, it, of communities like Bozeman um, and also with unparalleled uh, recreation access, um, folks are relocating there, which is has some opportunity, but it also has some challenges. So uh, we'll dig a little bit deeper into um, what that Zoom Town piece uh, really means for people who move there and people who live there. Um, so let's see. Um, chats um okay i don't see um i don't see any questions if people think about questions uh, feel free to um to type them in but um we've got a couple minutes left and i wanted to ask um um each of you to answer uh, briefly um how how is access to ready quality access to recreation changing um, changing your towns? Is it uh, attracting business, attracting remote workers? What are the trends that you're seeing actually on the ground in your communities? Um, this is Kathy. I, I can speak to that, Diane. Um, I, I reside in the city of Lewistown and we have a, a wonderful asset here, the Lewistown Trail System that, you know, is taking advantage of the Rails to Trails program. And the city's working and partnering with other organizations to, you know, pave certain sections of it, gravel it, maintain it, plow it. And it is actively used year round in the summertime by, you know, walkers, runners, you know, people walking their dogs. And in the wintertime, people will, you know, uh, cross country ski on it, snowshoe. And that's one of the very first things that people notice when they come to our town. And one of the first things that they want to utilize. And it, it makes our town um, more attractive just, you know, beyond the purpose that they came and they want to come back. And that's one of the things they consistently say is that I love the trails here and we need to do more. And, um, and so that's one of those opportunities in these outlying communities that we serve that we try and help them realize that they have an asset in their community that they ought to try and promote and take advantage of, you know, ultimately getting people outdoors, it improves health and wellness and, and people, you know, want to improve it, their area, make it look nicer. And, and it's just kind of a snowball effect. It's, it's been a, a very positive um, effect on our community. Racine, any insight? Uh, certainly. Outdoor recreation uh, ties directly into one of the three brand pillars for the state of Montana. It's more unspoiled nature than anywhere in the lower 48. Um, Glacier Country is eight counties, but we have over 75 communities 
in those eight counties. Um, we're lucky to be in Western Montana where there's so much public land and so much um, uh, access. Uh, but the smaller towns that are embracing how to build outdoor recreation. Um, Thompson Falls is a great one. They are just really embracing on how to build that. Um, has certainly made it more attractive, not only in just bringing people through who are, who are traveling through or recreating, but there are some communities who are looking at it as an opportunity to help grow their, their community as well. So it, it's critical. It's critical to the equation. Of course, things are a little different now. <laughs> We're, we're dealing with some different dynamics now and probably moving forward uh, that we have to, frankly, get on top of. But yeah, it's one of the key reasons that uh, tourism in our communities have really grown over the last 30 years. Thanks. Um, Jan, anything to add? Um, I was just going to add quickly that, that Racina talked about the change in uh, recreational visitors, both resident and non-resident. Um, this last year brought the highest number of RVs purchased in the United States in the Rocky Mountain area, along with boats, ATVs. So there's a lot of people that may or may not have had that outdoor experience. So it's creating a real need for communication and education about appropriate um, responsible recreation. And it's also an, a real opportunity, I think, for smaller communities to take a look at those recreational assets that sit around them. And really think about, you know, what are my priorities, what are my strategies, and what's my planning process? Because we know that people are going to come and they're going to recreate. But if you can have a plan in place on developing certain access sites, like for fishing, and publicizing what those are, and then maybe keeping some other ones for local use, um, it, it cuts down that friction, but it also sort of, um, I think, beelines people to what um, is most important for that community. Thank you. Um, well, we'll see uh, what next year brings. We're, we're about out of time, but um, I want to thank all of you immensely for number one, appearing today, but more importantly, um, what you're doing to um, leverage, protect, enhance, sustain, um, you know, Montana's secret sauce as the last best place. So thanks to all of you. Um, I, uh, just so you know, these, these uh, episodes are recorded and they will be available uh, on the website, Montana Access Project, uh, in a couple of days. And um, uh, so you, so if you forgot, if you didn't take notes, uh, um, don't worry. Um, and also, I'm going to follow up with each of you to see if there are any resources that you want to share, um, websites, uh, maps, et cetera, um, with, with folks um, as we go forward. So thank you very, very much.